I think most people intellectually grasp now the re regionalization. You want to have a, a regional government. You don't want to have a central central government. You want to be governed by you know, as small parcels as possible because I mean then you can't attend to the actual problems, right? I mean somebody far away doesn't even see your problems or can't address the problems. So they understand okay so provincial regionalization which leads logically also to independence but then on the, on, on the other side of the brain they <laughs> check like you, you described that right there is oh but we are a nation you know we they will not let us go that is that is the, the one thing they almost instinctively think and the other thing is uh, but there's the constitution it will not be constitution it's not legal I think this, this is the, these, these two things, a kind of patriotism and, and, and the other, so they don't let us go, and the kind of thing, this is not constitutional, which is obviously also a question to you, but I also would like to hear the, the other opinions. What would you respond to them? Jack, do you want to start with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, sorry, Rana, sorry, sorry, it's not, the, the two main concerns that you find when you speak to voters is that it's not constitutional. And sorry? And, and it's like they will not let us go. It is one nation, yeah. you know, I'm a patriot, so we are South Africans. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a philosophical question to answer. I mean, let me just give one example of this. So in the 20, in the 2009, 2000, going into the 2011 elections, uh, Eugene de Blanche was murdered in 2010, I believe. And our Facebook group at that point, we were doubling on a monthly basis. I mean, we, we grew fivefold in, um, sorry, 2009, yeah, going to 2010. Um, we grew fivefold in the months after Eugene to Blanche's murder. And then what happened in 2010? We had the FIFA World Cup. And the FIFA World Cup came in, and all of a sudden, it was Rainbow Nation again, and South Africa was one Kumbaya uh, movement, and all of a sudden we, we could see it. We felt the momentum behind Cape Independence just fell off a cliff. I mean, we 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 could see the people were talking about it. the country was on the on the cusp of civil war after Te Blanche was murdered, and then it just took a few football games, and everything's fine again. So. Perhaps that's a sad analogy to, to answer how we have found over 17 years how quickly the electorate changes. Let's give another example. Uh, the 20, um, going into the, the, the 2021 elections prior to that, we had, it was June, it was the, the KZN riots, where literally the country almost burned to the ground. Here in the Western Cape, thousands of miles away, you couldn't get toilet paper from your shopping center. You couldn't get food out of the grocery store because people were walking out with trolleys full of food because they were worried that the riots were going to spread from KZN to the Western Cape. And then what was it? it was six months later, no, everything's back to normal. Now it's fine, you know. So you'll notice also load shedding. We all have load shedding for. Uh, Four and a half years, four and a half years, non-stop load, non load shedding. Six months before an election, somehow the load shedding doesn't quiet hit you as much. And, and voters, for some reason, yeah, if the last, if the recent time and memory is, uh, is, is comfortable enough, then yeah, Cape Independence, unfortunately, doesn't seem to be at the forefront of the agenda. And if the DA does what they do best and tell people that it's too close to call and the ANC is going to get in, they vote DA. That's been our, our, our sad uh, realization. And how do I answer that? Well, things just need to get worse then, unfortunately. How bad do things need to get before <laughs> voters actually realize there is one and one only solution to it, and it is Cape Independence. Otherwise, in Bobby, here we come. Uh, yes. Probably. Yes. So uh, another interesting art, um, you know, analogy related to sports uh, is the example. Uh, the, there was an article recently on Cape Independence in a, a British newspaper, <laughs> and they interviewed John Steenhazen. And the article ends with John Steenhazen saying, "I would not want to lead an independent Cape 
because then I would not have the spring box anymore. So, I mean, the, you know, that's the shallow mindedness of some of our leaders when it comes to this. Um, but at the end of the day, when we look at some of these cherished institutions that uphold many people's patriotism, they're all under threat. I mean, if you look at the Springboks, for example, uh, the EFF has said they want the Springboks renamed, they want it completely changed, uh, they want to have stricter racial quotas in the Springboks, and at some point this just completely destroys the institutions you have that uh, uphold your patriotism. So I agree with Jack, I mean, eventually things are going to get worse for a lot of people, and people who want to avoid Cape independence or talking about Cape independence, uh, for those reasons, Reasons are eventually going to have to face uh, the harsh reality that many of the cherished things of South Africa won't be there anymore in 10 years. Um, going on the point about uh, is, uh, you know, Cape independence won't be possible because the national government won't allow it, or the constitution doesn't allow it. Uh, I don't think there's a single constitution in the world that actually gives you an explicit way of achieving um, you know, independence. Um, the, by its very nature, independence is not an issue of constitutional law, it's an issue of international law. Now certainly, you, in order to call a referendum, uh, you, you need to abide by the constitution, but then in that regard we have the constitution on our side, because it outlines the process that we need to call one. Uh, but when it comes to uh, you know, actually moving to being an independent state, it, it all depends on you know, the international support you can muster from uh, you know, partners around the world, uh, and ensuring that you have the will of the people on your side. If you have the will of the people on your side, then uh, rulings in the Scottish and UK Supreme Courts, which form part of international law, found that in a democracy, if you have an independence referendum, you cannot ignore the will of the people. If you ignore the will of the people, then quite frankly, you're not a democracy anymore. A couple of issues, if I may respond. Um, I've been using the example about nation building and the recipe for nation building in South Africa over many years. And I've said, and I, it's, it's, it remains true, the South African government and everybody's process after 94 for nation building failed. Why? Because the concept of nation building is built around sport. And it tries to create a feel-good feeling about sport. It started off in 1995 with the World Cup, when Mr. Mandela wore the number six jersey and everybody said it's fantastic. And how long did that last? A few weeks or a few months and then it was over and done with. Then we had the World Cricket Cup a few years later, here in Cape Town. I think South Africa fell out in the quarterfinals and it didn't last so long, so the feeling wasn't too positive. Then correctly, the World Cup in 2010, it was magical. For a few months, the thieves even stopped stealing things. It was just perfect. Everything was beautiful. How long did that last? It didn't last. Then it was again the uh, World Cup again. So we are stumbling from one sporting event to the next to try and create this impression of togetherness. But it doesn't last. It will never last. Why? If you want to create something that is truly going to last, you have to look at the diversity of South Africa. Not as a weakness, but as a strength. There's a reason why we have 11 official languages. Recognize that diversity. Accommodate the diversity and use that as strong building blocks and you can work out a constitutional dispensation where everyone will feel accommodated. And you, doesn't, you don't have to have exactly the same level of self-determination. Some provinces may say, no, we don't want to have anything. I always say we will we still be busy with the Western Cape and struggling to get what we want when KZN declares independence around the Zulu monarchy. It could happen overnight. So there are different permutations that can play out in that instance. If you talk about constitutions, one of the most beautiful examples of how it could be done is the Ethiopian constitution. Look, go and have a look at the Ethiopian constitution. It's a federal state and it recognizes, it consists of the different states and the states accommodate the different ethnic groups in Ethiopia. And there's a procedure written in the constitution that you have to go through. There's two referendums that you have to participate before you can go to independence. So nobody has done that yet. But it's accommodated in that instance. If I may just say about the people in the Western Cape, why don't they vote for independent parties in a much larger numbers? It's because people fear change. They are unsure. What would it mean? What would it entail? They know what they've got at the moment. Things work like this, and they can go in their car, and they can go to the Kruger Park, and they can come back, etc., etc. I take my own mother. My mother stays in Pretoria. 
She argues with me all the time, are you sure about this thing? Why are they saying that? Because they feel that, what about them? Will they be excluded? So mo most people just want to have safety in, as long as it's going to be okay in my lifetime. People are not capable of seeing over the hill what's coming in the future. And many people in the West can resist the idea. However, it can change overnight. When we saw the riots in, in KZN two, three years ago, imagine those same riots happen again, but this time not focused against property, but against minorities. It can happen tomorrow. Then I can assure you independence will happen overnight. And I'm not saying that's a good idea that we should have that, but that's just the reality that may play out. So it's a very difficult thing. If I can just take a point with regard to the ULA process. Self-determination and independence is a very difficult process. It's not something that can happen just overnight. And with all due respect, uh, I think you refer to Elroy Baron. Elroy is a councillor of the Freedom Front Plus in Mossel Bay. He's one of my councillors. He serves in all my structures. If there was this internationally recognized legal process, that you just need to do step one, two, three, four, five, somebody rings a bell and you're independent. Why is Palestine not independent yet? What about Scotland? What about Quebec? There are so many examples. It doesn't work that way. Yes, there are international rules that you can follow. You can apply pressure. You have to do that. But in the end, the international community will only follow depending on your internal processes and the will of the people in that area. If the people don't demonstrate the need for this, the international community is not going to get involved and say, we think you should be independent. They will not do that. What happens normally is international law will recognize the jure, what exists already de facto in a country. And that's the challenge that we will have to go through and get more awareness and get more and more people to, to accept the idea and to push forward. Now, if you look at the current political dispensation of what's happening at the moment in this election, and I'm very honest with you, if in this election we succeed with a multi-party charter to remove the ANC from government, and we put in there a new government of, let's say, the good people, I can assure you, the idea of Cape independence will get a setback and people will say, well, maybe it's not necessary. Maybe we can change South Africa for the better. Who knows? On the other hand, if a, another coalition comes to power, ANC, Contra de Cisre, uh, EFF, it will be to the benefit of Cape independence because it will perhaps shock people to understand where we are going in South Africa. People shy away from those realities. They just want to have a peaceful little world where they are at the moment. They don't want change. We, we are, it's our job as politicians to see over the hill what is coming. And we can see that. And we have not been proven wrong in any way. It has been playing out year after year and it's coming worse and worse and worse. I was in a debate the other day where somebody was phoning in from Mpumalanga. Obviously a DA support. Yes, but Cape Town is beautifully clean. I said, when have you been to Cape Town lately? It's not beautifully clean. I can assure you it's not. But that is the kind of perception that people would like to have. And obviously the DA is making use of that to create this false impression. Everything is just moonshine and roses. And that's why I've always said the DA will not succeed in exporting their form of government to the rest. As long as we don't go this route, we will only allow and import the destruction. I, because of my work, I go to Joburg, Tswane, Gauteng every 10 days. You know what I do? I sometimes take some time, I just go into a shopping center, I sit on a bench, and I watch the people, just for a little bit. And you can see, month after month, how things are going down, down, down. But the people who stay there can't see it. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that. They think that's how it should be. If you drive in Pretoria now, my mother stays there. I was in Joburg on Monday evening. The street lights are not working. The roads are full of potholes. It's like, it's like in deep, dark Africa. You, you, it's, it's, it's really physically just dark. No safe, nowhere safe, nothing, nothing, nothing. Why won't that happen to the Western Cape in time? It will happen here as well. And that's why we've got a huge challenge. But the, but the difficult thing is this. There's not a magic wand that you can just independence. It doesn't work that way. It's a difficult process. Can I ask that to a, sure. are you as a party then for pro, you're a, you're a party of the National Front, but you are supporting a Cape 
Yes. In a bit, a camp secession day. Sure. Sure. The point is this, and we've made that point all along. There are different forms and levels. Now, let me first say this. The Freedom Front Plus is a national party with representation across South Africa. And we participate across South Africa on a national level and in all nine provinces. The core of the party is self-determination. And we focus specifically on minorities. But we are saying the following. There are different forms and levels of self-determination. Because this form of self-determination may be effective in this part of the country. But everybody understands the whole idea of independence seems that it can only work successfully in the Western Cape for various reasons. So if, from our perspective, it's not a question of either or, it's and, and. So while you can do this, we fully support Western Cape independence, we're involved in that on a daily basis. My campaign in this election is about independence. My posters say, will say, choose freedom. That's what it's about. But we also need to understand, and that's part of the difficulty, Many people in the Western Cape do have family in the rest of South Africa. And you cannot, the question is, as if you are a national party, you cannot just walk away from that and say, well, we are not, don't have any interest in that, etc., etc. Time will tell in the future how we develop this, because we understand as well. When we get to Western Cape independence, and we will get to that, it will not be in our interest to have on the other side of our border an absolutely aggressive enemy kind of situation. It will not be to our benefit. We would like to prevent that. So, we, even if we go for independence, and we will have independence, we will never be not part of Southern Africa, although we be a different country. You will still have economic realities, economic ties, it will still be there, like visualize what's happening in the European Union. You cannot become completely isolated, you don't want that. I always say in terms of independence, and that's, that's the first prize. The first prize will always be to achieve what we want to achieve in terms of an internationally recognized negotiated settlement. That's the first prize. You can look at other examples internationally. That's the first prize. But you, you won't get to that point unless you have sufficient support and pressure that whoever you need to talk to, whoever you need to negotiate to, cannot ignore what you are saying because you have such strong support, they have to deal with it. Yes, Next I want to say something about that. What you are saying, what you are actually saying at the back of all of this is, if there is a secession order, you probably will have to fight for it. It's your border somewhere along the line. Like all over the world, it's happened. You're trying to prevent that. That is why you're going the legal route. And, sure. But on the other hand, you might have to be able to, yes. to, to fight for it. Of course. And that fight. is yeah. why you need the people to totally be with you. Because you're going to need them to fight. No, let me just try to explain it this way. It depends on how strong you feel about freedom. Do you really want to be free? Do you really want to be able to take your own decisions? Other people are not going to say, well, we think you should be free, let's give it to you. If, you don't, if you're not prepared to take it yourselves, mm -hmm. no one is going to say, we want to give it to you. Now, the question is, how do you achieve that? The first prize is in a peaceful manner. And you try to go a legal route, you try to go a peaceful route, you will not achieve it completely without politics. Because in the end, politics is involved, politics take decisions, politics make legislation, politics can amend constitutions. You cannot do that completely from outside and hope somebody else will do it on your behalf. It's got to be political inside and outside. But let's say you come to, and that comes back to the question just now that said people are scared because they will not allow that. Yeah, of course they won't. So what? Why is it up to us to say we can't have it because they don't want to give it? Let me give you an example. In the 60s and 70s, the ANC wanted one person, one, one, person, one vote black majority government. The National Party said, no, we're not going to allow that at that time. What did the ANC do? <laughs> that they say, well, well, they refuse it, so we give up on our idea. No. They continue to struggle, they change their methods, and in the end they achieved their objective. If we are serious about freedom and independence, we have to do the same. I'm not expecting them to say, yes, you can have it. I expect them to say, you can't. And then we take the decision when we come to that point. And I'm the first one, to, I will tell you, Section 235 does not allow full independence. I know that. 
But that does not mean that we're not going to have it. Yeah, if I, if I can maybe add to that. Um, I think the reason why every single person on this panel is sitting here is because we, none of us here are going to take up arms and start some uh, civil unrest. It's, we have mechanisms in place and as Kone says, the political, I mean, I think the political pathway is the ideal pathway to achieve this, the laws that support it. Um, to add to that, civic organizations like Des Palms, KFX and NPO, like Afri Forum, like Carp Forum, um, like Saka Licha, there are many, many, uh, like OTA, the tax organization, there are many, many civic organizations that are actually building grassroots decentralized frameworks that actually take the place of government because government is failing to deliver those services. So you're finding out in certain uh, communities and saying, no, we're going to ring fence uh, um, certain, uh, some resources that's not going to be paid in tax to the national government. And we're going to use that to fix potholes and things like that. And Afri Forum has done some fantastic work in, in a similar sense. So I, and that's a question that we've gotten for two decades now. It's always like, oh, the government won't allow it. It's going to be civil war. I, I really, if it's going to be civil war, then, then I'm quitting. That's, that's not what we're here to do. I don't think any of us sitting here are trying to push for anything like that. I think people have a, a, an unreasonable and irrational fear of government that the government's going to just come with helicopters or something and they're just going to arrest every single person that voted for a pro-Cape Independence Party and throw you in prison. It's just not going to happen. I mean, just to flesh it out a little bit more, we've had two incidences where the South African military have been used and the ANC rule. The first was when they went into the Lesotho and the second was when they went into uh, Zimbabwe. And I think Lesotho, they lasted just less than 24 hours. Uh, the police, I mean, the, the military there were looting the shops um, and, and the South African military had to call the troops back. It was an absolute embarrassment. Um, I don't feel like we need to talk about that, but if we want to talk about that, that's the reality. So there's not going to be any civil unrest, there's not going to be any conflict with the people of the Cape if the people, as Corne says, if you show to the government just how serious you are about Cape independence, not a single round will be fired. There will be no need for it. What will happen is we'll sit down in a room like this with the ANC uh, leadership, with the EFF leadership, with the Mkwantu SEs leadership, whoever it might be, whoever's running the national country at that time, and we'll go, listen guys, you know, we got a referendum where we got 85, 90% of Western Cape voters who voted in favor of this. It's not in your interest to oppose this. Now let's talk about uh, how do we practically uh, put this in place. This is the, the national debt for South Africa. How much debt does the Zania take? How much debt does the Western Cape take? What resources are we going to share? There's electricity production in this, in, in this part of the country. There's electricity production in that part of the country. We're going to sell it to you at a special rate, perhaps, whatever. There's thousands of things that would happen. It would be a negotiation. And, and as we've said for, for many, many years, um, as was repeated now, is that when you have Cape independence, you're not going to cut off the, the, the terrain of the Western Cape and float out into the ocean. The Eastern Cape, the Northern Cape, uh, KwaZulu Natal, all of these places are going to be our neighbors till the end of time. And we want to have good working relationships with them. And uh, KwaZulu Natal absolutely might get Cape independence before we do. And the rest of the country has got fantastic resources. And we've got fantastic resources. And there's no point um, in us not being fantastic trade partners and having good working relationships together. Can I ask, in terms of awareness, are you targeting specific areas only or are you across the Western Cape creating awareness of your... Well, let me okay, answer, let me answer that. strategy of marketing? Mm -hmm. Is it across the world? Which areas are you focusing? Let me answer that question in line with your question earlier about 
organizations not working together. This is where I have a slightly different view than, than perhaps was expressed earlier. I think it's fantastic that we have the ULA and CapEx and NPO and the Freedom Front and Referendum Party and whatever, all the different groups pushing from different angles with a slightly different flavor, whatever it might be. It just, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a far more difficult thing to, to shut down and stop and control if it's amorphous like that, if it has multiple different roots to it and multiple different seeds. So I think where the movement is as a whole, yes, I agree with Des that perhaps maybe some organizations um, could frame things better and maybe their approach is, is not ideal, but that approach appeals to a certain part of the public and rather have that part of the public on board in that manner. And, and the parties here, we appeal to a different part of the electorate because we have different characteristics to ourselves. So that's a positive, I don't think that's a negative. So who are we appealing to? Well, the Cape Independence Party, we have certain characteristics. We have, we have a belief in what we think an independent Cape should look like. We believe in decentralization. We don't believe in overbearing central governments. Um, and uh, you know we have opinions on certain thing, things. The referendum party is a lot more open to to the DA and, and their policies, which we don't see eye to eye on. Um, and the Freedom Front, obviously, as Corne said, they have both a national appeal as well as a provincial appeal. So everyone brings something different to the table, and I think that's the strength and the weakness. Dave, would you like to add something to that? We Sorry, Prof. Heiner, it's good to see you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> of, of, uh, we've had many discussions in your house about this, um, just to, about the fact of, of uh, they won't allow it, I think a very big part, and that's what we're all busy with every day, is to educate people that it is their right, their humanitarian right, under Articles 1 and 20, um, that, that they may strive for independence. Um, we, we just look at it and remember when I started off, I said I'm the only non-politician here. Um, we, we tend to look at it differently. We tend to play the what-if scenario from Cape Exit side. So we, we have advisory panels on education, on health, on social economic, on everything. Because our what-if is, what if we get to the point where we walk out of this relationship with South Africa with nothing? And if we just look at, at, at the defense capability, that's something we look at. Our departure point is we have nothing, except that one helicopter, I think they used the fuel with a sonar address, they used the last fuel. Um, we, we have people on board who are experts, the Air Force and the Navy, and if they sit you down and they tell you what the status quo is on hardware, you'll be shocked. So we cannot, uh, there is absolutely, we agree with the fact that there is a political process, but there is a part of that process which is a what-if part. And if we don't prepare for that what-if part, we're going to have a problem. We can't wake up tomorrow morning and say, it's 8 o'clock, kumbaya, we're independent, uh, Dr. Corneille has done his work hard, and we go to Simonstown and the last battleship there is just sunk. Or they dived with submarine into the floor around the seabed. Um, if you don't now build your perception around that what if, you're also going to come short because there's a reality to this process. And that is the, the angle that we look at it from. Because we, we, not, we leave the political side to the politicians and we work with the other realities around it. Yes. Also, for this town uh, <clears throat> specifically, I mean, you have done magnificent work in collecting big numbers, right? I mean, you have the biggest numbers more or less behind us, uh, behind yourself. I mean, I think COVID was a, a kind of a trigger, you know, people realized, oh, there is something bad, something is wrong, we have to do something. Yeah? And now, I think we have a pretty similar situation. I mean, Half of the city stinks, there's a pollution problem. Mm. People realize it's actually going down, down, down. I mean, there's a tainted cancer <laughs> all over the show. Why, I mean, I asked you that before, and, and, and I can't understand it. Why is it so difficult to leverage your community, your 800,000 people, and everybody goes to his friend and says, register there. So that you mm. finally crack the 1.6 million. 
I mean, that is something that should be possible. I think Dr. Conway touched on it earlier, that people get so used to a situation. Um, the first time I heard that we are dumping 65 million liters of raw sewage into the ocean every day, I went, wow! And we've had people up in arms and today, oh, so we dump 65 million liters of raw sewage in the ocean. Nobody cares anymore. Because we live in this comfortable bubble in the Western Cape, and I can say this because I'm a born Cape. The people in the Western Cape are way too at ease about what's happening. Mm. Ask people that flies up to Joburg every day. And this story, and I totally agree with Dr. Conay, the story of the DA runs the best province in South Africa is only because you're better than the Oaks with an absolutely bad standard. You're not good at all. But people are living with this perception. Everything's okay. I can drive to work. I've got no potholes. And that is the challenge. And that is why COVID, the only good thing about COVID and lockdown was people had to stay at home, read about what was going on, and we literally, registrations came in at a rate of about 10,000 a day. Um, it would be nice to have another incident like that, and perhaps it will happen when we all of a sudden see a coalition between the ANC and the DA. Um, there are certain triggers in this process. COVID was one trigger, we will have another trigger come. Uh, Robert referred to it earlier, um, it was actually Erika Chenoweth that did the 3.5% rule. And like he said, she said if you can mobilize 3.5% of the population behind the course. Now 3.5% of the Western Cape's population is 200 not thousand people. We have way more than that. But we have to get people to, to part the knowledge with them or to them that this may happen. Not can happen, this may happen. Next question. So Cape Independence has been said to be a, a racial movement to revive apartheid. I'll tell you your comments. Mine. <laughs> no, let, let's start with wrong. Yeah, so look, at the end of the day, we, we have to acknowledge we've had a very racialized history, and this has been uh, something that's dominated our history, and it's led to a lot of disadvantages and uh, lost opportunities for many people. Uh, and look, we can't you know, set that aside, we can't just pretend that that didn't happen. We, we do have to address it and we have to acknowledge it and we have to take steps. Not, we don't need to use racism to fight racism, we don't need affirmative action or BEE to fight this, but we do need to address that problem uh, in the long term. But what we should not accept, and we should, we should never accept it, is the weaponization of racism, these accusations of racism to try and shut down political debate. I mean, we see that all the time in South African politics, especially against the Cape independence movement, uh, and it doesn't make any sense, and it's just used by people who simply don't have any better arguments to use against us. The Western Cape is South Africa's most racially diverse province. 42% of the population is coloured, 38% is black and 17% is white. Um, so it, it's going to be a multiracial democracy where people from all walks of life will have a say in their future and uh, you know, it will diverge from what we've seen in the rest of South Africa and hopefully by testing out new, opportunity, new opportunities and new policies uh, we can actually start uh, dealing with many of the issues we see in, so in society like uh, the massive uh, racial inequalities that exist. So Connor, how do you respond to that? That secession is racist. Yeah, that was a logical reply. <laughs> Based yeah, on yeah. Um, the facts. Mm. The question has got nothing to do with facts. I'm not saying your question, I'm saying that kind of question. It's got nothing to do with facts. It's just a cry. If you stand for anything that they do not agree with, that's apartheid. If you stand for excellence in education, oh, that must be apartheid. So I don't take those kind of things really seriously because Unless you completely bow to what they say, you are pro-apartheid. It's, it's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. So, um, but you gave a correct factual reply, but the real reason behind that is an emotional kind of thing. If you do not support what we are trying to achieve, it must be apartheid, um, which is absolute rubbish. Historically, the term racist didn't exist prior to the 1920s. It was Leon Trotsky who coined the term to silence opponents of the Bolshevik Revolution. If you were against communism, you were a racist. So um, you had to be an anti-Semite if you were against communism because there were Jews in the Bolshevik party. So a racist stands for rather annoying communist-inspired sound syntactic. <laughs> Des, did you want to add anything to that? 
Uh, have you had to deal with accusations of racism for KPX? Oh, we've been called racists and folk starters and brown shirts and yes, I can, we colluded with the CIA and the uh, too many to mention. It's very simple. If you read what we say, we say we want independence for the Western Cape for all who lives in, within. That in itself can't be racist. And if you look at the direct democracy, where you look at what we su suggest as a Canton system, where you've got direct representation on the lowest possible level of governance to, to your community, can't be racist. And then I agree with uh, us white is only 15% or 16%. You can outvote us any day. <laughs> No, it is, it's absolutely, it's the go-to. A go-to is racism, a go-to is Jan van Riebeek, a go-to is colonialism, or another Orania, we've heard them all. If you oppose the National Party government, you're accused of being a communist. If you oppose this government, you're called a racist. No. Unfortunately, the media defends them all the yeah. time, the government as well. do you add anything to that? Do you ever have to deal with accusations of racism? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think... You know, if people arm themselves with the knowledge of history, you can just shoot these things down very easily. You know, some of the greatest losses of life we've had in this part of Africa. Look at the, the first concentration camps, the genocide that the, the white British inflicted on the white Afrikaners. So there you've got whites from one uh, tribe uh, committing genocide against whites from another tribe. Let's have a look at another genocide that happened in uh, the early 1800s. Shaka Zulu and the formation of the, the Zulu nation, depending on your historical records, wiped out anywhere from 1 million to 2 million of other black tribes. Absolute slaughterhouse. And so that wasn't the apartheid government, that wasn't uh, any wicked whites, that was Shaka Zulu. Um, and Mzilakazi. And, and, and Mzilakazi. And, and then let's go back even further. Um, you know, let's go back to you know, two, three, four, five thousand years ago when the Khoisan were the predominant tribe all the way up to Central Africa. And then in the Bantu migrations, the Bantu tribes, the Ngunis um, and the Bantus wiped out the Khoisan. Um, and pretty much the, the only part of Southern Africa where you still had the Khoi in the sand was uh, what today is the Cape. And in fact, um, that's why we also don't buy the racist arguments that uh, the ANC throws out. Uh, history can start in 1948. Um, history goes back to the beginning of time. And uh, here in the Cape, we're an amazing example of, as Rob said, the, uh, the majority population in the Cape is the colored population. And how did that happen? Well, that's almost four, 350 to 400 years of Khoisan and Malay and Indonesian and Buddha and French and English all intermarrying and, and what's this language called Afrikaans? You know, I love this word pisang. Pisang is actually an Indonesian word, you know, for a banana. And uh, you've got all these in interesting terms which form, you know, the Kapsatal and, and, and the Kapsakal tube. And, and I think it's something that when we look at history with open eyes um, and, and we, we, we see it for what it is and we cut away the, the, true, the true racists in all of this are the ANC and the EFF and anyone that complies with this agenda. If we were left to our own devices, we'd be just fine. I, here's another story I want to bring up. This was uh, in, in the 60s. Uh, the greatest protest in the Cape was under a man called uh, Salem Alun, who was one of our prized uh, uh, Air Force fighters. And it was half a million, 500,000. Cape Independence Party or Cape Independence supporters would love to see a protest that big. Imagine this, and they marched at night with, with torches to Parliament to force the apartheid government to not remove coloreds from the voting role here in the Cape. The biggest mass protest we've ever had. But the ANC doesn't want us to know about these parts of our history. So we completely disagree with all of that. Tell me where you want to start history and I'll give you an example of how the ANC and EFF agenda is the only racist agenda in the room. It's not, it's not us, it's them. By the way, Salem Lund was the top allied fighter a part of the whole Second World War, not just South Africa's top. He was the top Allied fighter commander. And the British in the film The Battle of Britain um, had Robert Shaw play the role 
but they took off the South Africa ensign on his um, uniform and didn't give him a South African accent because they want to camouflage the fact that their top fighter pilot Sally Malone was South African. And so Robert Shaw played a British person and they camouflaged the fact that their top pilot, fighter pilot was South African because in the 60s we were not top of the pops. Next question. Uh, we have been talking about complacency being sort of the biggest enemy of, of self-determination, yeah, Dr. Corne, yes, you, you, you brought that up. Now, here behind us is the banner, the, 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 the case for succession, the, the new book. I mean, the racial group or the heritage group with the biggest case for succession, I think, is the colored group in this country. Also, the most determined, they are not complacent. <laughs> And, and, and happy they actually want to have it, right? My question maybe to, to, to you, Dr. Peter, why is nobody here except you gentlemen? <laughs> well, we can only invite people, uh, but there could be logistical travel constraints. Um, the people come here who'd want to, but we found tremendous support in Mitchell's plane. For example, I remember a uh, friend in Mitchell's plane saying, why do we not have one single Colored policeman who speaks our language in Mitchell's plane, the local police station. They all come for the East Cape. They don't speak Afrikaans. Why can't we have our own policeman in Mitchell's plane? And they said, all the police we've got are on the pay of the gangsters and the drug dealers. And it's scandalous. And so I know that there's far more enthusiasm for Cape independence amongst the colored community than there's amongst the whites and certainly amongst the English speakers who seem pretty apathetic in many cases. Are they very happy voting DA, it seems? But yes, um, I don't see how it's racial. In fact, I seem to remember there's at one point you're accused of being a bunch of white Afrikaners and then you're accused of being a bunch of coloreds. That Cape Exit was just a coloured movement. And so it's interesting how you move from you're a bunch of racist whites to, well, you just represent the coloreds. And I think you get a buttonholed over and over by these characters. But yes, in, um, I'm sure you've found some of your best values have actually been in coloured communities. Absolutely, yeah. We've, we've had huge. Huge rallies. I mean, 2009, we had um, to then to, to honor the, the the end of slavery. We marched from Boerkop down through to Parliament, and um, yeah, we've had throughout the year fantastic involvement um, from all parts of the Cape. And as as Peter said, there's there's an anger, there's a strong anger in the coloured community far more than you see, especially, as Peter says, in the English-speaking white community. The, the white English-speaking community is the most complacent community, hands down. And the Cape white English-speaking community is, it's, yeah, I mean, they're just really, I'm, I'm embarrassed to be part of it. But anyway, it's uh, one of the voting groups that is just, yeah, very content to not see things, um, very happy with the status quo. Uh, we certainly aren't happy with the status quo. We see that Cullen's are very much not happy with the status quo. Um, and, and as Peter says, because in, in Mitchell's Plan and many parts of the Cape Flats, you've got schools in which children are not being taught in their mother tongue, the, the hospitals in which they have life-threatening uh, emergencies, they come in and there's doctors there who can't speak uh, their language, You've got a, a, an active crime situation that's breaking out. They're going to the police station, and you've got a police a general there that's been brought in from another part of South Africa because they're trying to meet a quota system. So when when there's life and death issues, and then obviously a phrase that we've heard a lot through through the last two decades is that um, many many coloured communities will say, "Once was two other class burgers, one other apartheid." And also, there's no dad at Klaus Burgers, and and this is the the truth. Yeah. It's uh, it's a terrible, terrible situation to be in. 